We begin with disturbing news. This morning, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband, Paul Pelosi, was hospitalized after a man broke into their San Francisco home around 2 a.m. and violently attacked him with a hammer. The alleged intruder, identified as David DePoppy, shouted at Paul Pelosi, quote, where is Nancy? He is expected to be charged with attempted homicide. This incident comes as Election Day is just 11 days away. Joining me now to discuss this and more, Zolin Kali Youngs, White House correspondent for The New York Times, Scott McFarlane, congressional correspondent for CBS News, and Ashley Parker, senior national political correspondent for The Washington Post. Thank you all for being here. Scott, I'm going to start with you. We've learned some new details especially that Paul Pelosi called 911 himself. What's the latest of what we're hearing about this and the possible motives here? Let's be clear. This is a grotesque set of allegations that this 42-year-old accused in this attack not only broke into the Pelosi home, but used a hammer to break into the house and to hit the skull of the 82-year-old husband of the House Speaker, also injuring Mr. Pelosi's arm and his right hand. Surgery was successful. The skull fractures have been... Uh, acted upon, and they're expecting a full recovery at the medical center at the San Francisco General Hospital. It's a grotesque set of accusations, but something else jumps out at me as grotesque. The parallels, the symmetry to what we saw 21 months ago. In this case, the investigators familiar with this case say that this accused assailant was saying, where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? Intended to tie up her husband on January 6th. Any number of those rioters were chanting, Where's Nancy? Nancy, we're coming to get you, bringing makeshift weapons, including at least one hammer on January 6th. And it, it just raises the question, is this a snapshot of where we are in America in 2022? Is that where our politics are? That this is both shocking but not surprising at all? It's, it's a critical question. Is this where we are? And I want to also point out that there, the threats against lawmakers have been rising in recent years. Um, just today, a man named Joshua Hall, who threatened to kill Representative Rick Eric Swalwell, he pleaded guilty to those charges. And then you have reporting that the Capitol Police has now begun a review of security of lawmakers. I wonder when you're thinking about all of this, what's the impact of this attack possibly on the future of the security of lawmakers? And what are you hearing about Capitol Hill police trying to keep people safe? Let me give you one number to start with. 10,000 threat investigations in one year for U.S. Capitol Police. And that's an increase from a few years ago. That's a dramatic increase from a few years ago. In the near term, Capitol Police are likely to expand the protection of the dignitaries, the people in leadership, those who have very significant threats against them. The January 6th committee members have had extra security. They may expand that to spouses and family in the wake of this attack against Mr. Pelosi. But there's a broader question. There's a finite number of officers. There's a finite number of resources. They've got about 2,000 employees, got about a half a billion dollar a year budget. But members of Congress live everywhere. They're not just at the Capitol. There's only so much space and bandwidth they can cover. Yeah. And, and Zolan, we are hearing from President Biden. He's saying enough is enough, calling this despicable. We're also hearing and, and learning that David DePoppy, this man, that he espoused all sorts of sort of conspiracy theories about COVID-19, about the 2020 election. I wonder what your sources are telling you, especially national security mm. sources, about how all of this comes together and the, and the ongoing threats of 2022. And I know you got your hands on some hot new reporting for us about this sort of warnings that we're hearing in 2022. Yeah, no, absolutely. Just today, uh, federal law enforcement was circulating um, a threat assessment that really states what has been a heightened uh, risk for political violence that has ex existed since January 6th. Since January 6th, you've seen DHS, FBI issue multiple warnings saying specifically that false claims about the election, um, the current political rhetoric, the current state of divisiveness, uh, that it could encourage people to commit the sort of attacks like we saw today. Now, this bulletin does not specifically detail uh, the attack on Mr. Pelosi, I should say that. But what it does recite and summarize is previous attacks against members of Congress and also saying ahead of the midterm elections that government officials as well as election workers could be at risk of further attacks by domestic extremists that continue to be motivated by those same false claims. This is the current security environment, this current threat environment that we're in. My colleagues have also uh, reported that 
Members of Congress fearing attacks like this have spent about $6 million dipping into their own campaign funds, their official budgets as well, just to pay for their own security. The neighbor of the Pelosi's in San Francisco noted today that, sure, there's a security detail uh, uh, for Speaker Pelosi, but she's in Washington today. And what happens also to the relatives of these members of Congress when members have to come back to D.C. to do their job? Both you're hearing it from federal law enforcement, you're hearing it from members of Congress as well. There's still a concern here, and the dangers and the risk that we saw in the wake of the attack on the Capitol have not subsided. And I keep thinking about, what if Nancy Pelosi was home? What would, it, what would the, this story would be so different, possibly? Possibly, if that man had seen what he was looking for, Zoe. I mean, there were people that were wondering, what if there was no rush to get members of Congress out of the Capitol on the day of January 6th? That same language was being used. We remember when Speaker Pelosi's office was also ransacked that day as well. Um, Based off of what's being reported, this person went in there and was specifically looking for the speaker. And we know not only did he intend to commit harm, but he did also commit harm at that point. It just so happened she was in Washington. That's scary stuff, Ashley. Um, and we've heard from Republicans, we've heard from Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy saying that they're wishing Paul Pelosi a, a speedy recovery. I also want to point out something that the, that the Virginia governor, Glenn Youngkin, said. He's, he was out campaigning today, and I want to quote from him directly. He said, Speaker Pelosi's husband had a break-in last night in their house and he was assaulted. There is no room for violence anywhere. But, he said, we're going to send her back with him to California. That's what we're going to do. We've covered all sorts of sort of attacks and, 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 and charged rhetoric, but I wonder what you make of what the governor is saying and the sort of political atmosphere that we're living through right now. Well, I would add it's not just the governor of Virginia, and that but is sort of crucial because that was a through line in a number, not all, but in a number of Republican statements and tweets today. It was sort of violence is never acceptable, but there was a local o Ohio representative who in a series of tweets, you know, said he hopes Paul Pelosi makes a full recovery, violence isn't acceptable, but, and then seeming to mock the calls of some liberals and liberal lawmakers to defund the police said, you know, but in a tweet, I, I sure hope that San Francisco sends their finest social worker um, to respond to the attack at the Pelosi household. Um, and even Marjorie Taylor Greene, who before she ran for Congress, uh, accused Nancy Pelosi of treason and seemed to suggest that she should be executed for treason. Um, she put out a tweet later today saying, again, you know, no, no excuse for violence, it's unacceptable. But let's remember all the times that I've been under attack. And so when you see violence like this on either side, it feels like the sort of normal, traditional thing is just a, this is unacceptable, full stop. Not this is unacceptable, snarky comment about her husband, snarky comment about liberal policies, you know, snarky both sides -ism. Um, But that was one thing that struck me in a number of the Republican responses we saw today. And as someone who's sort of been traveling, Scott, across this country, both of us, I keep thinking about just the fact that rhetoric really does have consequences. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes we look at Twitter and we look at these sort of exchanges, but people's lives can be at risk because there are people who will take this too far and will see the butt that Ashley's talking about as a sort of invitation for violence here. I'm also thinking about what's going on in Arizona, which is that there is a lawsuit going on because there's some worry that people are now staking out drop boxes. I even interviewed a voter who told me that he was going to be at mail drop boxes with his ice pack and his ice um, his ice cooler and his shotgun, his firearm, because he's, a, he's someone who doesn't believe that the 2020 election was fair. What are you hearing about the sort of intimidation of voters and election workers as we're heading closer and closer to election day? Let's start with what we hear from the experts. The 2020, oh, by the way, was the safest, most secure election in American history and done during a pandemic, which is a Herculean accomplishment. So all these claims, these baseless claims of fraud come in the wake of a very successful, uniquely successful election. So here we are with people monitoring drop boxes, a way to make it easier for people to vote. Monitoring the drop box, doing so armed or in an intimidating fashion makes it maybe harder for some people to want to vote. It's a disincentive. And that goes back to the previous point. If we hear about concerns that polling places might be targeted, election workers, administrators might be targeted, the fear is not just that they'll be targeted, but just the warning will be a disincentive for people to vote. It's voter suppression. So now we have a balancing act. We have people monitoring drop boxes. We want to alert folks to that. We have people 
who may be targeting extremist groups, targeting polling places. We want to notify people about that, but we don't want to dissuade people from voting. Millions have voted already in 2022. So far, it's been all safe. And I just wanted to go back to something you said in asking him that question about rhetoric having consequences. For someone like Speaker Pelosi, you can really draw a through line for the past decade. In 2010, right after Obamacare passed, um, there was a campaign by Republicans, by the Republican National Committee, called Fire Pelosi. Um, and it sort of, in, there were images of her engulfed in kind of hades like flames. And that was the first iteration, right? She's been vilified and demonized ever since this election cycle already. Um, Republicans have spent, she's the number one most vilified member of Congress in ads. Republicans have spent $80 million running 300 different unique ads attacking her. And then uh, McCarthy, um, the Republican leader, about a year ago was sort of making a quote unquote joke and he said he couldn't wait to get the gavel from Nancy Pelosi, but it would be hard not to hit her with it. Wow. And so when you look at that, what we saw last night feels like an almost all but inevitable conclusion of the past 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's scary stuff.